A group of women between the ages of 65 and 75 was interviewed. These interviews were the most poignant, possibly because most of these women had never had a vagina interview before. One woman, who was 72, had never even seen her vagina. She'd washed herself in the shower and bath, but never with conscious intention. She had never had an orgasm. At 72, she went into therapy, as they do in New York. And with the help of her therapist, she went home one afternoon by herself, lit some candles, took a bath, played some music, and she got down with herself. She said it took her over an hour because she was arthritic. <laughs> but when she finally found her clitoris, she said she cried. This monologue is for her. Down there? Honey, I haven't been down there since 1953. <laughs> no, it had nothing to do with Eisenhower. <laughs> no, no, it's a cellar down there. Very damp, clammy. You don't want to go down there. Trust me, you'd get sick. The smell of the mildew and the clamminess and everything. Woo! It smells unbearable. It gets in your clothes. No, there was no accident down there. It didn't blow up or catch on fire or anything. It wasn't so dramatic. I mean, well, never mind, never mind. I can't do this talk about down there. What's a smart girl like you going around talking to old ladies about their down there's for anyway? We didn't do this kind of thing when I was a girl. What? Jesus, okay? <laughs> Okay, there was this boy, Andy Leftcloth. Oh, Andy was cute. Well, I thought so. And tall like me, he asked me out for a date in his car. I really liked him. I can't do this. I can't talk about this. Talk about down there. You just know it's there, like the cellar. There's rumble sometimes, and you can you can hear the pipes and things, and little animals get caught there. <laughs> and sometimes it gets wet, and somebody comes to plug up the leaks. <laughs> but otherwise, that door stays closed. You don't see it or think about it. It's a part of the house, though, and it's got to be there. Otherwise, the bedroom would be in the basement. <laughs> right, right. Andy. Ugh, Andy was a catch. That's what we called it in my day. We were in his car, his new white Chevy Bel Air. I remember thinking, my legs, they were too long for the seats. I have long legs. They were smushed up against the dash, and I was just staring at my big old kneecaps when he just kissed me in this surprisingly take you by control like they do in the movies kind of way. <laughs> and I got excited, so excited, and well, there was a flood down there. <laughs> I couldn't control it. It was like this force of passion. This river of life just flooded right out of me, right through my panties and right onto the car seat of his new white Chevy Bel Air. <laughs> it wasn't pee. And it was smelly. Well, frankly, I didn't smell anything at all, but he said, Andy said, that it smelled like sour milk and I was staining his car seat. I was a stinky weird girl, he said. I wanted to explain I wasn't normally like this. I tried to wipe the flood up with my dress. It was a new yellow primrose dress, you know, and it looked so ugly with a flood on it. Andy drove me home without saying another word. And when I got out and closed that car door, I closed the whole store, locked it, never opened for business again. I dated some after that, but the idea of flooding made me too nervous. I never even got close again. I used to have dreams, though.
<laughs> crazy dreams. Oh, they're dopey. Why? Bert Reynolds. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. He never did much for me in life, but in my dreams, it was always Bert and I, Bert and I, Bert and I. <laughs> it was always the same general dream. We'd be out, Bert and I. <laughs> Being one of those restaurants, the one you see in Atlantic City with the huge chandeliers and the thousands of waiters with the vests. <laughs> Bert would give me an orchid corsage, I'd pin it on my blazer, we'd laugh. We were always laughing, Bert and I. <laughs> laughing, laughing. We'd eat shrimp cocktail, huge shrimp, fabulous shrimp. We'd laugh more. We were very happy together. And then, in the middle of the restaurant, Bert would pull me close and look into my eyes. And just as he was about to kiss me, the whole restaurant would start to shake. Pigeons would fly out from under the table. I don't know what those pigeons were doing there. And the flood would come straight from down there. It would pour out of me. It would pour and pour. There'd be little fish inside it and both. And there would be Bart standing waist deep in my flood, looking horribly disappointed that I'd done it again. Horrified as his friends Dean Martin and the light swim past and then take you know, to make you <laughs> I don't have those dreams anymore. <laughs> Not since they took away just about everything connected with down there. Moved out the uterus, the tubes, the whole works. My doctor, I think he's funny, he's a real comedian, this guy. He tells me, if you don't use it, you lose it. Really, I found out it was cancer. Everything around it had to go. Who needs it anyways, right? Highly overrated. I've done other things. I love the dog shows. I sell <laughs> antiques. <laughs> what would it wear? What kind of question is that? What would it wear? It would wear a sign, closed due to flooding. <laughs> what would it say? No, it's not like that. I told you. It stopped being a thing that speaks a long time ago. It's a place, a place you don't go. It's locked up, it's under the house, it's down there. Are you happy now? You got it out of me, you got an old lady to talk about it down there. Do you feel better? You know, actually, you are the first person I ever told about this and um, I feel a little better.